all. We've all heard that phrase many times, haven't we? Sometimes the phrase is used like super glue by those who wish to mend a shaky or broken relationship. Some think, or maybe their well-intentioned friends advise them, that is, if they think that this magic phrase, love conquers all, is something like a super glue which can be applied to a relationship, then everybody will live happily ever after. Love conquers all. This is Greg Albrecht, and you're here with us at Christianity Without the Religion, CWR, Faith Alone, Grace Alone, and Christ Alone. Today we're talking about a love that really does conquer all. I've heard the phrase, love conquers all, used by two people. In fact, in this context, I've heard it used a number of times by two people who should never have been thinking of getting married. And as they rationalized the fact that there were many red flags telling them not to get married from their friends, from their parents, from their advisors, but they said as if in some sort of infatuated trance as their eyes glazed over, love conquers all. And you need some organ music behind that in some kind of sweeping way. And we think that now everything is going to be fine. The sun will come up and all the problems that seem to be problems will just go away because love will conquer all. Well, obviously, the kind of love that we humans are capable of does not conquer all. If you've lived a few years on this old planet Earth, if you've been around the block a few times, you know that human love does not conquer all. Human love does not conquer hatred and animosity between races. Human love does not overcome religious strife. Human love does not save every marriage. Human love doesn't stop wars and violence. But there really is a love that really does conquer all. That's the title of our message this week. As we prepare for the coming of Christmas, we're going to talk about a love that conquers all, a love that really does conquer all. And we're going to be reading from Matthew chapter 1, verse 23, as our keynote passage as we prepare to read and hear the written revelation of God. Let's pray. Father God, we come before you to study, ponder, and peer into one of the greatest miracles and mysteries of all. Today we ask you that you give us a further glimpse into your love. Anoint our eyes that the scales may fall from them, or at least some more scales, so that we have a further and deeper appreciation and realization of your very nature. Teach us what really happened in that manger in Bethlehem, or at least more than we've known before, and what the birth of Jesus means for us. May the light of our Lord and Savior further illuminate the relationship you give to each one of us by your grace. And all of God's people said, Amen. Matthew chapter 1 verse 23 is a part, of course, of the Christmas story. It's the foundation, if you like, the very bedrock. The virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, 
which means God with us. This was the dream which Joseph was given, and he was given this message that a virgin will be with child, and she would give birth to a son who would be called God with us. Let me tell you a story about a king and a peasant maid with whom the king fell in love. The story is attributed to a Danish philosopher, a Christian named Soren Kierkegaard, who was born almost 200 years ago. I think about 196 or 197, if memory serves. Kierkegaard told this story as a way of explaining divine love, a love that really does conquer all. This king lived in a beautiful castle. He had riches and power. He had everything he wanted except for one thing. He had no wife, and he was lonely. One day, while traveling through his kingdom, he went through a small village, and he saw a young peasant woman. He was immediately attracted to her, and when he returned to his castle, he couldn't forget her. He couldn't get her out of his mind. He wanted to come to know her. He wanted to meet her and find out who she was. And so that hopefully they would both be able to come to enjoy a relationship that would build and grow a relationship based in love. But how would he be able to win her love? He called in his counselors and advisors, and they told him that the solution was really very simple. All the king had to do, because this was a matter of the king and all of his splendor and his power, and the matter of this peasant girl in all of her poverty, all the king then had to do was just arrive outside of her humble abode in all of his glory, with all of his retinue of soldiers, showcasing his obvious power and riches, and she would instantly be overwhelmed and fall at his feet in complete submission. But the king thought about that advice and thought, well, you know, I don't want somebody who fears me and somebody who is just in awe of all of the stuff that I have. I want somebody to be my partner. I want somebody to share my life with. I'm not looking for someone who will marry me out of fear or out of her own selfish material interest because she will exalt her own station in life as a result of marrying me. I'm looking for a lifelong companion. How will I know if she's truly interested in me as opposed to just my money and my riches. How will I know, he thought, if she comes to love me as opposed if she comes to love the material advantages that she will enjoy if she becomes my queen? There were so many barriers. He was royalty. She was a peasant. He was rich. She was poor. So he paced the floor night after night searching for an answer to this dilemma, and he still couldn't, of course, get this beautiful young lady out of his mind. Finally. He realized what his advisors and counselors apparently did not. The king realized that experiencing and enjoying a true and lasting relationship based on love demands a certain equality. A love that really does conquer all is based on God doing for us in terms of our relationship between ourselves and God, on God doing for us what we can never do for ourselves, or what we can never do for him, for that matter. Back to our story, or back to Kierkegaard's story. The king realized that he would need to descend from his greatness to serve the young lady, for it was impossible for her to ascend into his greatness. So late one night, long after everybody in the castle had gone to sleep, the king slipped out of the palace dressed in the clothing of a peasant, kind of like a little bit of a take on the prince and pauper, if you remember that fairy tale. He traveled to the young woman's home, appearing before her as a servant, so that he might begin their relationship on an equal footing. You see, the king wanted her love, not her fear. The king wanted her glorification, not his own. The king wanted to serve her, not the other way around. That's, of course, in a nutshell, why God came to be one of us. 
why he came out of the perfection of eternity into our imperfect world. The story of the king and the maid is one way of illustrating God's grace, God's grace in action. God loves us not as a result of what we can do for him, but rather on the basis of what he can do for us. His love for us is expressed out of his goodness, not as a response to the goodness that somehow we are able to produce through the good deeds which we do and then present before him. That's what God's grace is all about. That's what a love that really does conquer all is all about. Paul tells us, as I said last week, as I recited and remembered this passage last week in 2 Corinthians 8 verse 9, for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. What is the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ? Though he was rich, he was the king in the castle. For your sakes, because you're the peasant maid who has nothing to give him, he became poor, so that you, through his poverty, might become rich. You know, ironically, if we had been that maid, knowing that the servant who showed up at our door was actually a rich and powerful king, if we had known that, and we had been able to see through the clothing that the king had on, which identified him to us as a peasant, we probably, humanly, would have wanted him to show off all his glory. We would have wanted to say to God, well, please show me some miracles. Please show me some spectacular things. That would make the decision to follow Christ easier wouldn't it? Or at least, it would seem so, wouldn't it? If he just impressed us with all of his glory and his majesty. And of course, we would be more comfortable when God knocks on our door, letting him know, well, you know, appreciate your offer, but I want you to know that I'm not just a simple peasant person, but I've got stuff I can do. I've got ways of earning your love, or at least I've got ways to, to show you a little bit to prove to you a little bit of my love, we're more comfortable, aren't we, in terms of the relationship God offers us, if we can just think that somehow, in some small way at least, we deserve, even partially, God's love. But the Bible tells us, God's grace tells us, the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ in grace tells us that God is love, and that we come to know God by our heart and soul, not by our deeds. We come to experience God and grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, not by memorizing scripture or by studying doctrine. Not that those activities are wrong, but studying the Bible does not guarantee we will accept the love that God offers to us. We can become a PhD in biblical studies, and it doesn't mean that we will love God or we will accept his love. The fact that God is love is not an academic truth or pursuit that we can attain. It's a reality to which we can only surrender. Let me say that again. God's love is not something that we can attain, not something we can qualify for, not something we can take a bunch of courses for and receive a diploma in. It's a reality to which we can only surrender. It's a reality which we can only accept. The Bible tells us that those in whom Christ lives will live lives of virtue. There's no question about that. He will produce virtuous deeds and behaviors in us, and we will obey him. But the Bible makes it abundantly clear that human virtues are not capable of earning any reward or payment in kind from God. God offers his love to us on his terms, and his terms include the fact that he comes to be one of us, Emmanuel, God with us, God with us, and God for us. When God comes to us, he comes to us as one of us, as the king who left his palace and dressed in peasant clothes did to the maid, the object of his, of his affections and hopefully his love. That's what our keynote passage in Matthew chapter 1, verse 23 teaches. 
He was Jesus and is Jesus, God with us. The virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. God with us in the person of Jesus Christ was the beginning of the greatest love story. He came to be one of us to demonstrate his love for us, which reached its highest pinnacle and fulfillment on his cross in the single greatest expression of his love. God with us is the King of kings and Lord of lords knocking on the door of our humble abode, wherever it is that we may live, as one of us coming to us and serving us. God with us is the King of kings and Lord of lords offering us his eternal, unconditional, undying love, asking us to accept his love in self-abandonment rather than attempting to win his love in self-improvement. God's love is only given when we abandon ourselves rather than when we try to improve ourselves and prove by our improvement that we qualify for his love. That's not the way God gives his love. That's not God's grace. God with us, the King of kings and Lord of lords, tells us that he comes to proclaim freedom for the prisoners, recovery of sight for the blind, and to release the oppressed. Jesus, our Lord and Savior, asks us to open the door of our humble abode because we need to be set free from our fears, our bondage, our addictions, anything that keeps us from accepting his eternal, unconditional, undying love. God with us, the King of kings and Lord of lords, offers us a love that really does conquer all. In the person of Jesus, God came to us as the God-man, both divine and human, to be what we are and to experience what it means to be what we are, a human. He came to be physically touched by and to experience what it means to be a human being, to be touched by what we experience. That's what the baby in the manger was, a package that we humans could see and feel and touch and hear and, for that matter, even smell when we remember that someone had to change his diapers, his swaddling clothes. Jesus came to show us, to demonstrate his love for us, a love that really does conquer all. Jesus God with us didn't just talk about loving people. He didn't just tell us to love other people. He did it himself. He hung out in his earthly life with the last, the least, and the lost. He spent time with the alienated, the spiritual refugees, the disenfranchised, he spent time with people that the respectable religious leaders of his day wouldn't be caught dead with. Bono is the lead singer of the Irish rock band U2. U2 is one of the most incredibly successful rock bands of the past two decades and amazingly have Christian themes that can be found and echo throughout their music. Bono himself is an unconventional and outspoken Christian. Here's what he once said. God is in the slums, in the cardboard boxes where the poor play house. God is in the silence of a mother who has infected her child with a virus that will end both their lives. God is in the cries heard under the rubble of war. God is in the debris of wasted opportunity and lives. And God is with us if we are with them. Bono had reference, of course, to the parable of the sheep and goats in Matthew 25, when Jesus said that if we give a cup of cold water to someone who is thirsty, if we 
visit the sick and the imprisoned, if we clothe those who have need, if we express hospitality to a stranger, then we've done such a thing to him. Of course, there are those who are physically thirsty, hungry, naked, homeless, sick, and imprisoned. And there are also those who are spiritually thirsty, hungry, naked, homeless, sick, and in bondage. We can reach both kinds of needs by Christ who lives within us in his name. As God with us, Jesus embodies what God's love is. And of course, in the end, the human response of his culture that he came to, especially its legalistic religion, in the end, its response to his love was to kill him. But they found out that they couldn't kill Jesus. He was resurrected. They found out that they couldn't kill God's love because God's love is a love that really does conquer all. If you find yourself lonely at this time of Christmas, if you find yourself depressed during this month of December when everyone around you seems to be, or most of the people around you seem to be happy and buying presents and decorating their homes and having parties, being friends with one another, if you find yourself in physical or in spiritual need, perhaps even in a hospital bed, know that Christ has come for you. He is God with you. We think back to that stable in Bethlehem, and we remember that young couple, Mary, perhaps no more than a young teenage girl, and Joseph, perhaps a little older, a couple who existed on the ragged edge of life. They were barely surviving. They were oppressed by religion. They were oppressed by politics. They were poor. They suffered enormous grinding taxation. They were the first human beings to whom the King of Kings came. Mary was the first woman to whom Jesus came. In our story about the king and the peasant girl, well, Mary was a peasant girl. She was just a young teenage girl. And Jesus came, God in the flesh, knocking on her door, not as the creator of the entire universe, which he was, but to her, at least outwardly, as a baby to whom she had just given birth. And of course, he was both God in the flesh, the God-man. The kingdom of God arrived in the person of Jesus. The kingdom came down from heaven to this earth in the form of a servant. He didn't come in the power and glory he could have, arriving with breathtaking millions of angels and a light and sound show that would have blinded and caused people to lose their hearing. No, he came clothed in human skin. He came so that he might serve us. He came with his love, giving it freely, but without first waiting to see if we could prove our own love to him, if we could somehow earn or deserve his love. If you have a Bible in front of you, take a look with me briefly as we read from Philippians about a love that really does conquer all. Philippians chapter 2, who, in verse 6, being in the very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing. Chapter 2, verse 7 of Philippians, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Philippians 2, verse 9. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Pray with me. Father, thank you for your love that really does conquer all. Thank you for in the person of Jesus, you have come and continue to come to us in our need, in our heartache, in our pain, in our desperation. And you bring a love that really does conquer all. We pray your blessing on all those who have such desperate need at this time, wherever they may be. May you be with them. May you comfort them. May this time be a special time for them when they understand and come to know Jesus as they never have before. Send us on our way. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for continuing to be with us as we continue in our messages in this Christmas season. 
And we want to let you know that next week we will once again touch on and experience the encouragement God has for each and every one of us in one of the most relevant and uplifting themes of Christmas in our message titled, Do Not Be Afraid, based on Luke chapter 1, verses 13 and 30, and chapter 2, verse 10. Our message, Do Not Be Afraid. Now may the Lord of peace himself give you peace at all times in every way. The Lord be with all of you.